Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Engineering Dynamics. In this video, we will be talking about the principle of virtual work and how an analytical approach to dynamics can help us get the equations of motion in a more simple manner. Let's jump right in. So, like I said, we will be focusing on the analytical approach to mechanics, and that one is based around energy and work. So we're not thinking about it in a Newtonian kind of way where we think about forces and accelerations, but we're actually thinking about the energy that is inside our system and about the work that is done by forces inside our system or by the forces acting on our system. With this view, we have a better understanding of the me mechanical phenomena. So in summary, it simplifies the equations of motion and it gives rise to numerical methods. And the most important part in the analytical approach is, is that the concept of constraints is central. We're not thinking about constraints as something that is negative, but actually as something that we can leverage to get the equations of motion. So let's talk about a simple example and understand why the principle of virtual work is so useful to us. So here we have a simple pendulum, we have mass m, our length l, and now we want to get the equation of motion for this simple system. First of all, we have, of course, the acceleration in direction x that is given with mg because we have a force acting on our system, and that is the force of gravity, and of course we have the reaction force in this direction. Then we have the acceleration in y. We have zero forces acting in y because gravity is only acting in direction x in this case, but we have a force in y because of our reaction force. So this will be our resultant from x and y uh, of the reaction force x and y that is pointing towards the center uh, from our mass. And of course we have a uh, constraint that we have to consider and that is that the length of our pendulum always stays constant so we have x squared plus y squared equals l squared. Those three equations are considered a algebraic differential equation system. We have not only a differential equations the equation because of uh, our x double dot and y double dot but we're also having a constraint, and this is where the algebraic, algebraic part comes into play, because this is something that we also have to consider to solve our equations. And you might think that this is a fairly simple system, and why do we already have three equations? And you are right, this is a very difficult way to get the equations of motion, and we want to find a simpler way. And this is exactly where the principle of virtual work will help us. But first of all, we have to talk about the scalar product or the dot product, as you might call it. And just to remember, the scalar product is V transpose U. So when we have two vectors and they are orthogonal to each other, like in this case, V and U, we have zero. When the vectors like A and B are not orthogonal to each other, so this is not 90 degree, we have a scalar that is non-zero. So here we have, for example, just a vector 110 and 200, and the scalar product is two. We can use the scalar product to get a projection. So we want to project the vector i on top of uh, the vector j, so in direction of j. What we do for that is we do i transpose j divided by the length of j squared times the length of j. So what we get from that is basically a 2 from our i transpose j, 4 is the length of our vector squared times our vector, that's the direction we want to go to, and we get our 1, 0, 0. So p is zero, 1, 0, 0. So we use the scalar product for a projection. This is very important to remember. Now we have, again, our pendulum, and we 
have a certain path that our pendulum can take or certain configurations that our pendulum can take. And this configuration is called, or those configurations are part of the configuration space. So where, how our pendulum might be at any given point in time. And we know where the pendulum can move because we have a sphere, or not a sphere, but a circle where our pendulum can move. And of course it can move only orthogonal to the position, uh, or I'm sorry, it can move only in a tangent to that circle. So it will never move in this direction. So it will not move in that. So we consider these direction, this is the U, a direction where our system could move, or in this case, our mass could move. We're not thinking about where it is moving right now or how it is moving. We're only thinking about where could the system go to next. And this is called our virtual displacement because virtual because we're not actually displacing it. We're only thinking about where can we displace the system to. And what we see now is that our reaction force R is orthogonal to our DUs. And now we have to use this information somehow. But first we have to introduce a new notation and because we don't want to write x double dot and y double dot, we just want to have one simple notation. We have a sum from one to three because we have three directions. We have our mass, our acceleration in direction one, two, three, our force that is acting on our mass in direction one, two, three, and our reaction force that is acting in direction one, two, three. And for each direction, they have to be in equilibrium. And that's why we have a equal zero. And now we have the principle of virtual work where we consider this part basically a force and we multiply it with a possible displacement. So force times displacement is work. And because we have a virtual displacement, we have also virtual work. And now we can think about the fact on about how the reaction forces and the virtual trans, uh, virtual displacements act with each other. So again, in vector notations, we have our mass, we have our use, we have our axis, and we have our reaction forces. Here we have to transpose because this is how we get the sum. And of course, we have our uh, virtual displacements and they have to be in equilibrium. Now we consider only the reaction forces and the possible displacements. And here we have it graphically again, our possible displacements that lie on a tangent to our configuration space are orthogonal to our reaction forces. So our transpose du is equal to zero. So we can get rid of the reaction forces when we project our equations of motions into the space of our possible displacements. This is a very important concept. Now let's look at a example or basically the same example as before, but now actually written out. So we have our system of, or basically not a system, we have our pendulum with the force of gravity, length L and angle theta. Here we have the equations that we had before. So acceleration in direction one, acceleration in direction two. And we have our force of gravity act acting in direction one and the two reaction forces. Now let's look at the reaction forces first. So we have theta here. So in direction one, we have minus cosine and in direction two, we have minus sine R. And R is in our case, just a scalar. So we go back to our vector notation. So we have M u double dot minus x minus r transposed du is equal to zero. And here we have, we'll have a look at r transposed du if that's actually zero, like we considered it to be beforehand. But first we have to consider what is du. So what's the direction of our virtual displacements? And this is where we get our virtual displacements from. This is again our configuration space. This is our vector du. So 
here we have again theta, so this is cosine theta, and this is sine theta. So again, written in xy, we have minus sine, because this is direction 1, and this is direction 2. In direction 1, we have minus sine. In direction 2, we have cosine. Nothing is happening in the third direction, so we just have a 0. So now that we have the reaction forces and the virtual displacements du, we can go back here and actually multiply them to see if it's actually zero. So we have cosine theta r, sine theta r and zero, and this is our virtual displacements. We multiply this with that and this with that, and we get sine theta times cosine minus sine theta times cosine times r. So this will be zero. We don't care about r. So we were right that when we project our forces into the space of uh, virtual displacements, the reaction forces vanish. But of course, this is not everything that we want. We want to get the equations of motion. So now we have to exp uh, now we have to write our positions, or better say our accelerations that we need here. So first of all, we have our position u1, that is just a cosine. Then we have the first derivative, that's u dot i, that's minus sine theta l times theta dot, and of course our uh, acceleration, that is minus cosine theta times l times theta dot squared minus sine theta l theta double dot. Because once we have to derive uh, this one, and then we have to derive the theta dot. And the same, we do the same for the acceleration in the second direction, so u2. And now we can combine this information and get our equation of motion. So here, again, this is what we have to solve now. We write everything else, uh, we write everything out. So we factor out the m first, then we have our, our use here. Here we have our force, that's our x. We have to transpose because that's our sum, and this is our virtual displacements. Displacement, sorry, du. If we do a multiplication, we get this. But at a, at a closer look, we can see that first we have a sine cosine l theta dot squared, and then we have a minus sine cosine l theta dot squared. So these two just cancel out. And then we know, of course, that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So we have a sine cosine sine squared here and a cosine squared here. So together, they just equal to 1. And we are left with L minus L times theta double dot. And the only thing that we are left with is this one and this one. So we have minus L times theta double dot minus sine theta uh, times g, our force of or our acceleration due to gravity. And if we just switch the sign, we get our known equation of motion for a simple pendulum. So we have sine theta times g plus l times theta double dot equals zero. And you see, we got all this one without actually thinking about the directions of r or the scalar of R on how much the reaction, how big the reaction force is, where it is pointing to over time. We essentially just got rid of it just by projecting our equations of motion into the space compatible with the constraints. So that was our du. And by that, we got rid of them. And it was easier for us to get one system or one equation that describes the, the, the motion of our point, and we did not have to deal with this one. I hope uh, this video gave you a small introduction into engineering dynamics and the analytical approach to engineering dynamics. If you have any questions, you can post them down in the comments and I will do my best to answer them. In the next videos, we will be talking if this principle can be also applied to a system of particles because now we only work with one, and then we will slowly progress to more and, more and more difficult parts in engineering dynamics. 
Of course, there will be other videos that will just focus on examples with actual numbers. So if you are interested in that, check those out. If not, I thank you very much for your attention and see you next time.